The second reading this morning is taken from Zechariah um, chapter 2, verses uh, 1 to 13. A man with a measuring line. Then I looked up, and there before me was a man with a measuring line in his hand. And I asked, where are you going? He answered me, to measure Jerusalem, to find out how wide and how long it is. Then the angel who was speaking to me left, and another angel came to meet him and said to him, run, tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of men and livestock in it. And I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. Come, come, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have scattered you to the four winds of heaven, declares the Lord. Come, O Zion, escape, you who live in the daughter of Babylon, for this is what the Lord Almighty says. After he has honored me and has sent me against the nations that have plundered you, for whoever touches you touch, you touches the apple of his eye. I will surely raise my hand against them so that their slaves will plunder them. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me. Shout and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declare, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. The Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. This is the word of the Lord. Good joy. Let's pray. Lord, help us uh, as I speak to understand, Lord, your message to us. Show us in our hearts, Lord, uh, what you would want us to do and how we should be. Amen. Two builders, Gary and Dave, uh, were nailing some cladding onto a barn. And Dave reaches into his nail pouch and he takes out a nail. And half the time he hammers the nail in. And half the time he throws a nail away over his shoulder. And uh, Gary was very confused upon seeing this. And he asked Dave, why do you keep on throwing nails away, Dave? And Dave replies, well, if I pick up a nail out of my pouch and it points at the barn, I nail it in. Otherwise, I throw it away because it's obviously useless. And Gary slaps himself on the forehead and he says, Dave, you numpty. There is absolutely nothing wrong with the nails that point the opposite way. They're for cladding the other side of the barn. <laughs> Say nothing about builders, Terry's not here. Um, but this building story introduces our biblical building story. Can you remember from last week's message what God's people in Jerusalem were supposed to be rebuilding and what they were building instead? What were they supposed to be building? The temple. And what were they building instead? Their own fancy houses. Yes. And what did the people through Zechariah, what were they called to do in chapter 1? 
Turn back to God. Yeah? And what was the promise? And he would return to them. Good, some people are listening. <laughs> In other words, he says to the people of God, does the Lord, repent. You've got your priorities wrong. Focus your energy on the worship of God and not your material comforts. And here at the beginning of chapter 2, we have the continuation of Zachariah's vision. It's all part of the same vision. Um, and the first character introduced is a member of the building trade, a young man carrying a measuring line. We would say today that they would be a surveyor or a architect or uh, a building technician. And the young man's job is to measure out the site of Jerusalem for planning the rebuilding of the city walls. The city walls were destroyed in the sacking of Jerusalem in 586 BC. And in the vision, the angel who is delivering the message to Zechariah dispatches another angel to call this young surveyor back again from his task. Run, tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of people and animals in it. Jerusalem will suffer urban sprawl because of the population growth which will burst the city bounds and walls will be useless. And part of that population growth will come from the return of the Jewish exiles who live and remain in Babylon. They were, you know, remaining in Babylon in exile. And part of the, you know, the vision is to call those, those people back. And at the time of Zechariah's vision, it was estimated there were about 40,000 people who had returned to Jerusalem. But many more remained in Babylon. The land of their captivity had become the land of their nativity, one commentator says. And one of the purposes of Zechariah's prophecy is to motivate these exiles to move out of their comfort zone in Babylon and back to Jerusalem to do the work of rebuilding the city. Come, come, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have scattered you to the four winds of heaven, declares the Lord. Come, Zion, escape you who live in daughter Babylon. Now, ha ha, what about Nehemiah, you might say? <laughs> what about Nehemiah? What about Nehemiah? You see, Zechariah's prophecy in 520 BC talks about this city without walls. And yet Nehemiah completes the rebuilding of the walls in Jerusalem some 120 years later with God's help and God's blessing. And you can walk around the walls of Jerusalem today um, with Turkish additions. You know, um, they're probably not Nehemiah's walls, but they're in a the similar situation. So the prophecy of a city without walls you know, must be fulfilled beyond Nehemiah's. And the clue to this comes in verse 10 and 11. Shout and be glad, daughter Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. God is coming to live with and among his people. And it refers to the coming of the Messiah that we know as King Jesus. In John 1 verse 14, it says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus comes, God comes and makes his dwelling among his people. Zechariah 2 verse 11 says, Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Interesting to note who the I is in that verse, if you look at it. Seems to be both the Lord and the one whom the Lord has sent. Lord Jesus, God incarnate, come sent by the Father to live among us. So in the day of the coming of the Lord, many nations are joined to the Lord's people. I think we can see this as the inclusion of the Gentiles into God's people.
people. This is the both the birth and the growth of the church, the city of God without walls. That's the first message for us today, I think. That is of growth. The church is to be a growing church. One of the problems that Jesus had with the Jewish teachers is that they wanted to restrict the blessings of the kingdom of God to strict national Judaism. Like the young man with the measuring line in the vision throughout church history, people have attempted to restrict the church to certain boundaries. Many in the early church, church thought you'd have to be a good Jew to be a good Christian. That was one of the big battles that, that Paul had. But the Lord appeared to Peter in a vision and showed him that the Gentiles should be accepted into the new church. Remember the vision of the, of the, 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 the tablecloth that comes down from heaven with all the non-kosher animals in it. It says in Acts 10, then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Which is good news for us, isn't it? Because most of us are not Jewish. You know, and now we're included in the, in the church, the family of God. Again, Paul was appointed as the apostle to the Gentiles by our Lord Jesus. He says in Galatians 3, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And Jesus has given this, us this same great commission that he gave to Peter and to Paul. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So why should we seek to limit our expectations of the growth of his church? Ask yourself honestly, do you think this church can grow? Do I expect God to use me to share the life-changing message of Jesus with others? Not what I think I should be doing. Do I expect that God will use me? Do I think my workmates, my neighbours, my family members could become followers of Jesus? Or am I guilty of having a restricted vision and an unbiblical mindset? Ask God to give you eyes of faith. One of the scriptures that Brian Mason, the speaker that we had come to speak at our men's day, was this. He said, please reflect on this it's from Isaiah 54. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Just one of the scriptures he felt he had for us. The church is to be a growing church, a church without walls. The second message, I think, in this passage for us is that we are to be a guarded church. The church is to be a guarded church. Although there is no stone walls around Jerusalem in this vision, the people of God are not left without protection. God says, I myself will be a wall of fire around the city. Psalm 7 says, my shield is God most high, who saves the upright in heart. Isaiah 30 says, the Lord is the rock of Israel. And the reason that God guards his people is that whoever touches Israel touches the apple of his eye. That, that phrase, apple of his eye, comes from Deuteronomy 32. It says, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert place and in the wilderness, I'm sorry, in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Right at the beginning of the Old Testament, God says of Israel, his people, you are the apple of my eye. 
The apple of the eye is the pupil. It's the most delicate part. It's the part that must be protected at all costs. You know, as humans, sight is our most precious sense. You know, we're not dogs. Dogs use their noses, yeah? Um, but we use our eyes and we need our eyes. And that's why if someone pokes you in the eye, it's, it's the most painful thing, isn't it? They can poke you here and nothing happens. If someone poked me in my eye, it would really hurt. Other commentators say that the term means in Hebrew, little man of the eye. It refers to the reflection that you see of yourself in another's pupil if you stare into their eyes, if you watch them closely. It has that sense of being watched over closely. It has that sense of intimacy with God. And as the new Israel, God guards his church. In Matthew 16, Jesus says, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. As Christians, we are deeply loved by God as his precious children. But as God's church, we also cooperate with God in keeping ourselves under his protection by using the provision that he's given us, namely prayer. Yeah, we are protected by God, but we also have to remain in his protection. Ephesians 6 is known well by many of us, isn't it? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armour of God so you can stand against the devil's schemes and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So in prayer, we put on the armour of God. In prayer, we pray for God to protect others. We are protected by God spiritually because we're the apple of his eye. He loves us so much. And these fiery walls speak to me of holiness and purification, of Holy Spirit cleansing. They're walls not for exclusion, but inclusion with holiness. John the Baptist said of Jesus, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The meaning of that phrase is debated, but I think fire here is to be linked with the Holy Spirit, with purity. Entering into the holy city of God involves purification. As, we, you, know, as you purify needle, if you're going to pop a blister, you purify your needle in, the, in a flame, don't you? To kill the germs. As we go into the kingdom of God, we are purified by these fiery walls. It's purity. We're a guarded church. And the third message for us is the church is to be a glorious church. Jerusalem will be a city without walls, and I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within God is calling his people to flee Babylon, the place of the enemy, and return to Jerusalem, Zion, the holy city, dwelling place of God with his people, and the sign of God's presence with his people will be his glory. Back in the wilderness, the sign of presence, the sign of the presence of God was the Shekinah glory over the tent of meeting. Now it was this, you know, this fiery cloud that indicated the presence of the Lord. At the dedication of the first temple in 1 Kings 8, it says the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. If you think of the coming of Jesus, that scripture we had before, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and that verse continues, we have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. It was a glory, wasn't it, that was revealed at the birth of Jesus. You know, the angels appeared in the sky. The glory of the Lord was all around. It was revealed on the, on the Mount of Transfiguration when, you know, Jesus was surrounded by light. 
It was revealed at the resurrection. But also paradoxically on the cross, we have the glory of Christ suffering for us, the supreme act of grace. And the glory was also revealed in the early church. At Pentecost in the upper room, tongues of fire appeared and rested on the heads of the disciples. You know, as the Holy Spirit descended. At the trial of Stephen in Acts 6, all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. It shone with the glory of God. As they stoned him, it says, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. How can we, as a church, be glorious? 2 Corinthians 3 says, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So we're called to contemplate the glory of the Lord. Yeah, we're called to stand in awe of God, aren't we? As we sang earlier. And as we contemplate the Lord, glory of the Lord, we will reflect the glory of the Lord in our lives. Jesus Christ is the glory of God in the fullness of his radiance, it says in Hebrews. And as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we become more like Jesus. And we reflect his glory in our lives. Very occasionally, the Shekinah glory of God becomes physically visible in the gatherings of God's people. I've never seen it. But there are reports of fire within and above the Azusa Street meetings, you know, when there was the Azusa Street revival uh, in California. Recently, I've heard of the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory of the Lord appearing in a Reading Baptist church when there was a mini revival there. But the glory we should desire is the glory of our transformed lives, faces which shine Jesus, lives which mirror Jesus. Yeah, some Christians seem to shine for Jesus, don't they? Yeah, you can see it on their faces. Others seem to think they can grump for Jesus, but we shouldn't really aspire to that. You know, our aim should be to be changed from glory to glory, as the song goes, that we might shine for Jesus. And there's a final fulfillment. When we talk about God guarding his people and Israel being the apple of his eye, we may have many questions when we look at current world events. What is God doing allowing his people, the Jews, to be attacked by terrorists? And if we look further back, we look at many holocausts and pogroms and persecutions by the Romans and the Turks and the Christians and the Muslims. And similarly, Christians around the world are being persecuted, which indeed Jesus predicted. But if we follow the argument in Romans, God has not abandoned his people. And there is a plan to incorporate the Gentiles into a renewed Israel. But I think also God is protecting the Jewish people. Since independence in 1948, Israel has been attacked many times, sometimes by overwhelming odds, and has prevailed. Zechariah, too, speaks of this wall of fire around Jerusalem. You see, Israel today is protected by an iron dome. It's not a wall of God's glory. It's a Patriot missile system supplied by the United States. It intercepts most of the rockets that are fired at Israel by Hamas and Hezbollah. And I think, my opinion, is that Israel will continue to prevail. But it will only be fully protected when Jesus returns. I don't think by any means that whatever, whatever Israel does, not everything that Israel does is right. They need, they need to act righteously as well. But I happen to think God 
you know, still has them as part of his plan. But I think Israel will continue to prevail only when fully protected when Christ returns as Messiah. And we'll look at this further, but Zechariah 14 speaks of a day when the feet of the Lord will stand on the Mount of Olives and rule the earth from Jerusalem. And the nations, the Jews and the Gentiles together, will go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And Zechariah 8 speaks of how the Messianic king will come to Jerusalem on that day. The Lord will appear over them and will shield them and save his people. And Isaiah 4, verse 5 to 6 says, Then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over everything, the glory will be a canopy. It will be a shelter from the heat of the day and a refuge and a hiding place from the storm and the rain. There will be a day when peace will rule over Jerusalem and the surrounding lands. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, may we be a growing church. May we be a guarded church, knowing your protection. And may we be a glorious church, reflecting your glory among us. Amen. Amen.